Hi, this is the last in the series of lectures on persistent homology and uh, topological data analysis for undergraduates. Today we're going to be talking about cubicle complexes and persistence. So this will be useful when analyzing digital image data or image data that can be easily digitized uh, on a grid. So if you think back to what we've been doing so far with homology and persistent homology, everything has been based on a simplicial complex. So we have vertices, edges, triangles, and tetrahedra on the left. And on the right, we have a cubical version. So what we're going to do is we're going to be working with vertices, edges, as we did with simplicial complexes, but we're going to be working with squares instead of triangles and cubes instead of tetrahedra. This is because we're going to have the an underlying grid. And we're going to build our structure our simplicial co our cubicle complex on that grid. So the vertices will only be the vertices of the grid. The edges will only be the edges of the grid. The squares will only be the squares formed by the grid. And if we're in higher dimensions, we would have cubicle, uh, we'd have cubes formed by the grid as well. Okay, so now what are the differences? As I said, we're <coughs> the cubes. Uh, in, we can talk about a cube in dimension one, two, or three, and so on. The cubes are located on the grid. They must align with the grid, and the size is fixed by the grid. This is different from simplicial complexes where simplices can be located anywhere. There's no predetermined alignment, and they can be any size. So these uh, can be used in uh, you can have a simplicial complex and a cubicle complex built on the same data. However, uh, we won't go do the, use these interchangeably. Here, we're only going to be talking about cubicle complexes. OK, here's a small cubicle complex. So we have the grid vertices, grid vertex locations. They're in red. We're going to assume they're in the complex. And then we have some vertices, some edges, and squares. So here's an edge, say. and you notice if we include the edge in the complex, we must include the vertices, the lower dimensional faces, just as we did with simplicial complexes. Same thing for squares. Here we have a square, and the vertices and edges have to be included in the complex as well. So here the complex is in blue, and it uh, does not use all of the vertices of the uh, grid. Okay. So what's a cubicle complex? Well, it will consist of vertices, edges, and squares, and in higher dimensions would be three-dimensional cubes or even higher. The rule is that if we have an edge that's in the complex, then its vertices must also be in the complex. If we have a square that's in the complex, its edges and its vertices must be in the complex. Okay, now one of the things that you see, it's very natural to talk about the product structure on a square, we can think of it as being a topological product of two edges. So here we have a square S. And you notice I have an edge. Let's assume it's sitting on the grid. And the vertices are located at I and I plus 1 in the uh, first, direct, first coordinate direction. And then we have a vertical edge, J. And its vertices are located at J and J plus 1 in the vertical direction. So now we can create a square out of that. And you see we can get the vertices of the square. In this case, we label the lower left vertex i comma j, the upper right hand vertex i plus one comma j, the lower right hand vertex that would be i plus one j, and so on. All right, that's the labeling. We're going to write s the square. We'll see it, say it equals i cross j. This means it is the set of all x comma y, so that x is between i and i plus one, y is between j and j plus one. And we can talk about the boundary of a square, just as we talked about the boundary of a two simplex, giving us a triangle. So here, though, we have this nice product structure. We'll say that the boundary of the square is the product of i with the boundary of j. So the boundary of j here is the two points j and j plus 1. The boundary of an union, the boundary of i, product with j. And the boundary of i is i, i plus 1. So we could write it this way. The boundary on the left here, we see i, that's i, i plus 1, product with j, the bottom vertex of j, the capital J edge, 
and then ii plus one, chronic with j plus one, the top vertex of that edge. And the boundary we pick up is the union of these two. Similarly, we this is now take, take the union of that with the union of boundary i and j, and here for boundary i, we see i and i plus one, product with j, j plus one. This gives us the four edges. So these are geometric constructions. But of course, we want to do things algebraically. We want to build chains complexes. So there's an algebraic version as well. So now we'll call the generators for the chain complexes uh, that are built on these vertices, edges, and cubes. We'll call them elementary cubes, all right? To distinguish, say, between a bigger cube, a very large square, we would call a, an elementary square. OK, so we want to define chain vector spaces. The groups are generated by these elementary cubes, so vertices, edges. And for the algebraic element, the chain will write i with a hat over it. That will be the generator corresponding to the geometric object, that elementary cube, capital I. OK, now we have a product, an algebraic product, which mimics the geometric product we just defined. So I'll use diamond for the product. And now we're taking an algebraic product, so we would take p hat product with q hat. And let's say that p hat and q hat are elementary cubes. What is that product? It's defined to be the geometric product, and we take the hat of the geometric product. So this is an algebraic construction. So remember p, p, q, p cross q, those are geometric. p hat, q hat, and p cross q hat, those are the corresponding chains, generators for chains, and this is all mod 2. And now we can find a boundary this way. So for instance, if we're in R1 and we have a, an algebraic vertex i, what's its boundary? 0. What if we have an algebraic edge, so i, i plus 1, so that's a chain. What is its boundary? It's the chain consisting of the vertex i plus 1 plus i. That's the base case. And what we're going to do is use this product structure to define the boundary inductively. So let's see how this goes. So we want to define it inductively. So suppose we have an elementary cube. So that would be i1 plus i1 cross dot 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 cross ik. You have the algebraic chain corresponding to it. We're going to take its boundary. We're going to define it in terms of the boundary of its faces. So let's call this is a k-dimensional chain. I'm going to take the k-dimensional boundary of this. It's going to be boundary i plus 1 product with the chain generated by i2 cross dot 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 ik. So this is an edge on the left. This is a co-dimension 1, a one smaller dimension face, plus the boundary of i1. That's an that's a edge here, and then that will be two points. That, sorry, that will be the edge product with the boundary, k minus 1 boundary of the k minus 1 elementary cube chain. All right? Let's see how this works. Let's do it in three dimensions. So here we have a cube q, geometric object. It's the product of i1, the edge is i1, i2, and i3. And you see it extends from i to i plus 1 in the first direction, j to j plus 1 in the second, k to k plus 1 in the third. And now we want to compute the boundary. Well, there are going to be six faces, so we should wind up with these six faces as our uh, boundary. So let's do it inductively. So we take the boundary of q. What does that equal? It's the boundary of i1 hat product with i2 hat product with i3 hat plus i1 product with the boundary of i2 hat product with i3 hat. And if we work this out, we want to pick up the six different faces. So for example, we're going to have, for the boundary of i1, we're going to pick up i plus 1 product with jj plus 1, that's i2, and kk plus 1, that's i3. That is the, see it's i plus 1 there, so that's the right-hand face as we see this. Similarly, when we Take the other endpoint, we get i product with jj plus 1 again, kk plus 1. That's the left-hand face of this. And then similarly, we can do the front and the back and the bottom and the top. 
for this formula. So it's complicated, but we can do this inductively. Now, what do we want to do with this? We want to be able to compute the homology with regard to this uh, algebraic structure, so the cubical chains. So we do the same thing we would do in simplicial homology. We have our chain complexes. Here's dimension chain complex. Here are the chains of dimension i plus 1, dimension i, dimension i minus 1, and so on. When we take the boundary, the dimension drops. So we would have the i plus 2 boundary mapping into i plus 1 chains, the i plus 1 boundary mapping into i chains, the i boundary mapping into i minus 1 chains, and so on. And once again, we can show that the composition, boundary i plus 1 followed by boundary i, is 0. That's what makes homology work. So if we do that, let's just do a simple example. Suppose we have our square s extending from i to i plus 1 in the horizontal direction and j to j plus 1 in the vertical direction. If we take the boundary, we'll do this geometrically, what do we get at first? We get the square, the four edges. When we take this boundary, we get the vertices. But we see that each vertex appears with multiplicity 2. There are two copies of this. Why? Say in this lower right-hand vertex. Why are there two copies? Because it's the that vertex is in the boundary of the i to i plus 1 edge and the j to j plus 1 edge. All right? It appears twice. We're doing everything mod 2, so the boundary is 0. Okay. Now we can compute the composition. Let's do it algebraically. So let's do boundary 2 followed by boundary 1. Boundary 2 followed by boundary 1 of that same chain i to i plus 1, cross j to j plus 1. All right, if we do that and use the boundary formula, I won't read, through, I won't do all of the details here. What we'll do is we'll have what's boundary 2, that's boundary 1 of i i plus 1, product j j plus 1, plus i i plus 1, product boundary 1, j j plus 1. And we can work it out. Take these boundaries, the bound, it's the boundary of i i plus 1, there's a an i and i plus 1, in both of those, we have the product with j, j plus 1. On the right, we see i, i plus 1 product with j, i, i plus 1 product with j plus 1, and j and j plus 1 are the boundary of the edge, j, j plus 1. All right, and if we work this out, what we want to do is have it get some cancellation. So what we see, I will uh, go through the middle steps, but what if we work it out? What we'll see is some cancellation when we take the zero boundary of uh, a vertex, we get zero. This drops out, and we see i product with j plus i product with j plus 1 here in the first row. And if we keep going, we get cancellation. We'll see that's the blue. Down here, we see i with j. And uh, we'll also see i, i plus 1 in here. There we go, i, i plus 1, so on. So all these terms drop out, and we get zero. So let's continue. Of course, we could do this in general. We're not going to do higher dimensional boundaries. What we wind up again with, again, is because the square of the boundary is zero, that means the image of boundary i plus 1 is contained in the kernel of boundary i. So again, we can do kernel mod boundaries. Okay, so here's the definitions, zi of x, that's the kernel of boundary i. Boundary i is the image of boundary i plus 1. And the i tomology group is the quotient. The i cycles mod the i boundaries. Okay. And it goes through exactly as before. Of course, when we're computing boundaries, we're doing it with cubical homology, cubical complexes. Right. Now, let me just say something here. We're computing homology with cubes. Previously, we computed homology with uh, simplices. Now, if we had a cubical complex, we could try a, a grid. We could use simplicial homology there and compute homology as well. It would turn out we get the same thing. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this course, but there are different homology theories. Here we're seeing two, cubical and simplicial. There are others. You might see something called singular homology, which involves maps of triangles into a space. You might see a uh, 
theory based on differential forms. If you've had some geometry or differential topology, that's called Durand cohomology. All of these different homology theories satisfy the same set of axioms. And it's a theorem that if you have the same coefficients, then the different homology theories give you the same uh, homology groups. So the homology is actually, the resulting groups are independent of the, act of the way you got there, all right? Uh, that's beyond the scope of the course, but it's, this is an interesting fact about homology theory and it, what, makes, what makes topology and especially homology a very general, uh, a very general uh, construction. Okay, let's do some examples. All right, here's a simple complex X contained in R2. So I haven't shown all the grid points. This is just the uh, complex itself. All right, and if we look at it right away, we can say what's H0? Well, there are three connected components, one on the left, the big one, and then these two points. This tells us that the zero-dimensional homology is Z2, it's three copies of Z2. What's the one-dimensional homology? Well, we see three cycles, the cycle in the upper right-hand corner. I'm just going to circle it, but that's not the cycle. It's actually edges around it. We have this big one in the middle. There's a cycle, and here's a cycle. So we see three independent cycles. The one-dimensional homology is three copies of the integers mod two. All right, here's a more involved simplicial complex. Uh, this looks something like a box kite, if you're familiar with that. So what we see is there are no faces in the middle. It's hollow in the middle, hollow faces. On the top, what we see have is four sides, but you could stick your hand through the top of it down into the middle. But the bottom is a filled in uh, is a cube with all six faces. So those faces are filled in. So now what's the homology? Well, it's all connected. So that means the zeroth homology group is the integers mod two. If you think about this, and I'll let you do, let you puzzle over it. There are four independent cycles in dimension one. So that means the first homology group is a fourth power of Z2. And now we have the second homology group. The only cycle we see is the boundary of that cube in the bottom, those blue faces, that gives us a copy of Z2. So we can see the cubical homology here like we could with not too complicated simplicial complexes. Okay, we can do filtrations and it's similar to what we did with simplicial complexes. Now we have nested sequence, we can have a nested sequence of cubical complexes, say XA1, A2, and so on, but there's no longer a RIPS construction. We could build it by hand, but there's one important example or special case of filtrations which comes up when we're doing uh, cubical complexes. That's what we would call sub-level set filtrations. So let me illustrate that. Okay, so let's say we have a, uh, a grid. Let X be the full complex on the set of points and vertices. So in the plane, it would be, uh, say we have a rectangle, going from one to n, one to m in the y direction, and we, the vertices are the set of all points i, j on that grid. And then we would also have the full complex would be the vertices, all the edges between them, and all the faces. Okay, so it contains edges, i, j to i plus one j, i, j to i, j plus one. So the ones on the left are horizontal edges, the ones on the right are vertical edges. And it contains all the squares, i, i plus 1, product with j, j plus 1. So now to do sublevel set filtrations, we need a function on the vertices. So we'll define f going from the vertices to some set a. Uh, could be the subset of the real numbers. Often what you'll see here, if we're thinking about digital images, we might have colors that we're using, and the colors might be associated with a number. Often you'll see grayscale. Numbers going from 0 to 255. Okay. We want to interpret F as a set of colors, grace as in, or intensities, as I said. That's on the vertices. We want to now extend F to the edges and the faces. So the rule is that an edge is assigned the higher of the two vertex values. So you see on top, <coughs> excuse me, that top edge. That's assigned the value three because the higher of the two values, two and is uh, two and three is three. The face is assigned the highest of edge values. 
So for this face, the highest edge value we see is three. The edge values we see are two copies of two and two copies of three. So the face gets a three. So now what we're going to do is, fil is find a filtration by an increasing sequence of values. Okay, so here's an example. With that square that we just had, and with those values, one, two, and three, I'm going to define a filtration. So X1 will just consist of all, all cubical simplices, uh, all cubes, which have value one or less. That's just the vertex in the lower left-hand corner. If we extend it to X2 and say all vertices, edges, and faces, which have value less than or equal to two, we pick up two edges, the value two, and we have the three vertices there. The last stage will be X3. That's all of these uh, cubes that have value less than or equal to three. That's everything. Okay. So the values of edges and faces are assigned. The sublevel sets are subcomplexes. So if we have a value A, that's a function value, XAI equals the vertices, edges, and faces for which the function value is less than or equal to AI. So here's a more involved example, an interesting example. So we have an image from the digits data set. Uh, this is a data set from scikit-learn.org. This is a Python machine learning library. So it, these are uh, handwritten digits that have been digitized. Okay. So <clears throat> let's see what we've got. Uh, before I go on, the numbers you see here that I've assigned so the numbers on the right are the numbers, these numbers are the function values on the vertices that we see. Uh, those have been reversed from the values that are in the in the uh, digits data set. Because I want to use a uh, sublevel set filtration, I want to move up through it to get this shape coming through. Uh, okay. So that means in particular that I have the uh, lighter values or smaller numbers. Okay. So let's go and see what we've got. So we have a simple filtration. I picked out values 3, 7, 10, and 15. And I'm showing you in the diagram X3. So all the vertices, which have values less than or equal to 3, so in this case we have 0, and zero 2, and 3, are and 1 are showing up. And we take the edges between them. So we see 1, 2, 3, 4 edges up on the left. These two vertices are not connected to any edges, and we have this one edge over on the right. So that's our X3 subcomplex. And uh, if we keep going, uh, before I do anything further, let me just say, you notice down here we have the barcodes. What's the barcode of that, that subcomplex? Well, we have, we have one, two, three, four, five connected components. So at three, we're going to see five component connected components. Do we see anything in dimension one? No. All right, let's continue. All right, so uh, now I'm showing you X7 and X10. X7 on the left. X10 on the right. And X7, this means we add all edges, vertices, edges, and faces with value less than or equal to seven. So you see we pick up, we pick up three, squares and some more edges, right? Does that change the number of connected components? Yes, right, it drops. Drops down to one connected component, and you can see here on the barcode, you see in yellow, what I've shown you is the, the cells in the complex which have been added between X3 and X7, right? Now what happens? Uh, we go to X10, so now we're adding all the all the cells, vertices, edges, faces, where the value is less than or equal to 10. And we see we pick up in red, we pick up four more faces, and we see that the figure closes and we get a cycle in dimension one. All right, so now what's our barcode? The barcode when we go to uh, X10, we now have a single connected component continuing. I'll mark that in red just to show you where we are, that it's on the right on X10. Now the interesting feature we see is the one dimensional cycle that formed when we went up to the value 10 and it persists until the value 15. 
What happens when we get to X15? Everything fills in. We get a single connected component and no cycles at dimension one. So that's the end of this example and the end of this session. Uh, it's an interesting subject to look at cubicle complexes and the applications to digital images and uh, to, of two, three, or higher dimensions. Thank you.